there's a family-owned restaurant in Morton Grove, Illinois, called Burt's Place. It's a pizza joint, but actually more than that, it's the place where you can get the best pan pizza, certainly in the Chicagoland area, and I bet anywhere in the country. The pizza's made by Burt Katz, and it's served to you by Burt's wife, Sharon. Now, let me tell you about a recent uh, trip I made with my family to Burt's. We walked in, uh, seated right away, uh, were served antipasto salads that were phenomenal. Just as we were finishing our salads, the pizza arrives. It's got this caramelized crust around, not too much cheese, the delicious sauce. Uh, we ate the pizza, chatting with each other. At one point, Sharon came over, served us some more pizza, uh, chatted with us for a while, compliments to the chef, pay the check, and leave happy. That was our experience the last time we went to Burt's, and that's always our experience at Burt's. Well, now let me tell you about some experience I've seen, experiences I've seen other people have at Burt's. I've seen a couple arrive to a restaurant that was basically empty except for us and one other family and be told they're going to have to wait two hours. Um, I saw someone scoffed at for trying to order an appetizer. Uh, I saw someone scolded for serving themselves, uh, scalded, uh, scolded, scolded, they didn't scald themselves, maybe they did, <laughs> scolded for serving themselves another slice of pizza. And I saw someone barked at sharply in a foreign language for trying to pay their bill. So what, like how is it that we have these amazing experiences at Burt's and other people have these awkward to terrible experiences at, at Burt's, like what's the difference? I've thought about it a lot and I figured it out. The difference is that I'm a lawyer, and I think like a lawyer, and these other people are non-lawyers who think the way normal people are supposed to think. Uh, so what do I mean when I say thinking like a lawyer? Well, before I went to law school, I thought I had a pretty good idea about what it was to be a lawyer. I mean, I'd seen uh, Matlock and LA Law, so I figured lawyers were super good looking, fierce advocates for their clients, a little cool maybe on the personality scale, and wore a ton of seersucker. And if you watch uh, any kind of lawyer shows today in pop culture, The Good Wife or anything like that suits, um, you probably think lawyers are even better looking than I thought they were. Uh, uh, plus, again, this sort of cool professionalism, maybe not so loyal um, in their personal relationships and fierce advocates for their clients. Well, we all know that drawing lessons from pop culture about what a profession is like is dangerous. I mean, I watch The Big Bang Theory, but I don't think that makes me an expert on physics or physicists. I know what Bazinga means, uh, but that's about it. Um, but, um, but there are some truths we see in pop culture about lawyers. They're fierce advocates for their clients. Uh, they are cool and professional, and on a per capita basis, definitely more seersucker than the average person in the population. Uh, but there's more than that that makes a lawyer a lawyer. What really makes a lawyer a lawyer is that they approach problems and think like a lawyer. So what do I mean by, like, by that? Well, there's two kind of connected ideas. One is, lawyers study rules obsessively. Now those rules might come from, let's say, the criminal code that says it's a crime to steal, or they may come from um, a contract like online terms and conditions, and even lawyers just usually click I agree. Um, uh, or it might come from the United States Constitution. But in any event, uh, lawyers study obsessively rules. We try to understand them in all their nuance, and that allows us to avoid the kinds of intuitive thinking that are so helpful in normal life. But in legal life, you need to understand and obsess over those rules. That's the first thing lawyers do, but the second interconnected thing is that we then help our clients to navigate those rules to accomplish their goals. So there are three primary ways that lawyers help their clients sort of work with rules. I'm gonna explain those to you today, and then I'm gonna show you how you can use those uh, in your everyday life. The first thing that lawyers do once they have a comprehension of the rules is they help their clients navigate through, they guide their clients through the rules. And I don't mean guide like a tour guide who says, oh, you know, this is the arch, this is the rock. I mean, I mean like a, a mountaineering guide, someone who takes you through a treacherous pass where there are lots of ways to make a false step and you come out in the end in one piece. That's the kind of guiding lawyers do. Let me give you an example from my practice. So I work at the Northwestern Entrepreneurship Law Center with um, a lot of tech entrepreneurs, which is pretty cool. Recently, four tech entrepreneurs came into the center, and they had this idea that they wanted to set up a new company. Great, uh, very normal for us. 
and they wanted to all have an equal vote in it. Great, no problem. But the thing that was unusual about them is that they owned different percentages of the business even though they wanted their vote to be the same. So the person who owned 10% of the business would get the same vote as the person who owned 60% of the business. Now that's unusual. The other thing they wanted uh, was to not have to deal with a board of directors or have that kind of formal thing. Okay, so now we're thinking about this problem. We're trying to think how can we get them through the rules to where they want to go. If we set up a corporation for them, which would be a normal thing, well then you gotta have a board and it's complicated to do the voting that way and that's not a perfect fit. So we navigate them over to the limited liability company statute, which is another way you can form a business entity, and we set them up that way. There it's very normal to se separate voting from economics. And it all worked out. So that's the first way that thing that lawyers do, navigate through the rules. We're not helping them break the rules. We're not helping them sidestep rules. We're navigating them through rules. The second thing that lawyers do is we layer rules on top of existing rules. You've definitely seen this in your life. You experience it almost every day. If you check into a hotel, you have to initial the registration card. If you go to a public pool, you see a sign posted with all various rules. These are rules layered on top of the rules that we all have to adhere to. So going back to my tech entrepreneurs, um, they had this notion that they wanted all their decisions to be made on a majority basis. So since there were four of them, three of the four agree on something, then that's going to be what happens. And again, that's pretty normal. The limited liability company statute says, okay, if you, if you majority rules on almost everything. Notice what I said, almost everything. Some things, like selling the business, um, require uh, usually a unanimous vote. You can't force someone to sell their ownership stake in the business. So what do we do? We write them a contract, which is the way lawyers layer rules on top of rules. And that contract then says, OK, if a majority of us agree to sell the business, we're all going to go along with it. We're all going to vote how we need to vote, sign whatever we need to sign, and make sure the business gets sold. It's called a drag along agreement. That's what we wrote for our clients. And that was layering a rule on top of rule. OK, the third thing. Uh, that lawyers uh, do with their clients and helping them to get through rules is we have this concept called changing jurisdiction. Uh, this is this, if you don't like the rules where you are, you go somewhere else. It's the same idea as a college student doing spring break in Montreal where the drinking age is 18. Um, even though it's like the wrong time of year to go to Montreal, but you go there because you can drink, right? Um, so what you do is you take, you, if you don't like the rules where you are, you shift somewhere else. So my tech clients. Um, they want to form an LLC. They're all based in Illinois, so it makes sense. We should start up an Illinois under the laws of the state of Illinois. Start up an LLC under the laws of the state of Illinois. Um, but uh, there are a few things about the Illinois LLC statute that aren't ideal, especially if you're trying to attract investors and depending on how you're going to run the business, the way they wanted to run it. So we studied other states. Are there other places where they could form this business? And we looked all around and found, hey, look, they can form this business under the laws of the state of Delaware a state none of them had ever visited, a state most people don't ever bother to go to, unless those people are the legal persons we call corporations or LLCs, which love Delaware. Delaware has a really fr business-friendly kind of uh, law, so we set them up in Delaware. They're still here, but we, we shifted jurisdictions, moved them to the place they wanted to go. So there, we've got three strategies. We've got guiding through like a mountaineering guide, um, we've got layering rules on top of rules, and we've got switching jurisdictions. And we can see all of those at play in our daily lives. You know, there are rules around you, whether you know it or not, everywhere you look. We've got them in the office, we've got them at school, we've got them on the streets, and we've got them in our homes. And we can use legal thinking to navigate through those rules. So let's run a real world example and let's uh, get back to Bert's place. At Bert's, we'll get to see an example of all three of these legal strategies. So the first thing we should know is that Bert's has to comply with whatever laws they have for pizza restaurants. So there's like the health code and the labor code. Um, the village of Morton Grove has a bunch of rules about running restaurants. Bert and Sharon Katz have layered on top of those rules a whole new set of rules. They're codified, and they're in a written document that you can get right now outside of Bert's place. It's called the menu. Just walk over, pull one out. So let's take a look at the Burt's menu as lawyers, the way I would look at it, and see if we can get any clues about what the rules are. Okay, so look at the top. Pizza for grown-ups. Okay, well, we might bring my kids there, but that's okay. Maybe there's a loophole. And then underneath that, on time, every time. That's telling me these people are concerned about timing. If I wanted to have more evidence of that, I flip the menu over to the back. For service at its best, please call ahead. Do you see the word please is in all caps and underlined? They're not saying please. This isn't a request. This is a command. <laughs> if you want to know whether it's a command, it's also inside the menu. For service at its best, please call ahead. The first time we went to Burt's, 
called ahead the day before. They like at least a day's notice. Uh, uh, what do you want to order? I told them everything we wanted to order. You want appetizers? Sure. How about salads? Oh, what dressing do you want on the salads? OK, I, mean, I think I can come up with a dressing. And what do you want to drink? I didn't know that. That's OK. They can be flexible on drinks. But everything else you need to do. So if these are the rules, <laughs> if these are the rules at Bert's place, then what do you think they think of someone showing up unannounced? Is that please call ahead for service at its best? No. Right? So you're going to have to wait two hours. Then it's like you called ahead, OK, even though the restaurant's completely empty. Um, what about ordering an appetizer? You know, you get to the restaurant, and you're like, you know, I didn't know you had onion rings. This seems like a great idea. Does that sound like on time every time? No, you're throwing off the whole schedule, right? Follow the rules. Remember I told you that um, there was a customer who was barked at for trying to pay his bill? Um, he was trying to pay by, pay by credit card. And the foreign word that was yelled at him was, niet. You can't pay by credit card at Burt's. It's a cash-only operation, baby. And they'll take checks if they have to. But it's really a cash-only operation. Do they have an ATM at Burt's? It's not a friggin' bank. It's a pizza restaurant. You go down the street. You go to the ATM. Sharon will wait. She trusts you. Come back with the cash. OK? That's how you have a successful experience at Burt's. Now, there are some other rules that I admit are not written down that you have to kind of get to know at Burt's. Don't serve yourself a pizza. Pizza, you are not a barbarian. Sharon will do that for you. Um, should you issue a compliment to the chef? <laughs> yes, it's mandatory. It must be done before you leave. And don't ask for the check too early, or there's a half hour penalty per request for the check. Um, just you've got to time that just right. But if you follow all these rules, you're going to have a great experience at Burt's. OK, ordering pizza is one thing. And if you want, after this session's over, I can talk to you about where to stand in line at Costco. I got a whole legal analysis of that. Ordering at the drive through at KFC. Um, I've, even mowing your lawn, I've got some really good stuff on that. Um, but, but these are all kind of transactional, maybe mundane, normal things we do in our lives. What about something a little bit more profound? What about if we talk about personal relationships, the relationships that we have with each other, um, romantic and otherwise? So one thing is we should recognize, in terms of the first, this guiding through the rules, everyone starts with a set of baseline rules. These are common across our society and our culture. Things like you say hello to somebody or hi or hey when you greet them. Uh, things like you should like your friends and your friends should like you. <laughs> things like you should love your lovers and they should love you depending on the duration of the relationship, but there should be some kind of at least affection, <laughs> affection or attraction there. These are baseline rules. Can't get around them. They're just there. But on top of that, in our society, we layer on additional rules. We do that in two ways. First, as individuals, we each layer on our own set of rules, if you think about yourself. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes to receive compliments. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes to give compliments. Do you like to laugh along with people? Do you like to get a laugh? Um, and so that kind of normal thing about human interaction. Does this work for love and attraction? You betcha. Maybe you've got a rule that I like someone to wow me with their physique. Maybe you want them to wow you with their intellect. Maybe you want them to wow you with their sense of humor. But you've got your own rules that you've built and stacked on top of our basic rules that guide sort of what you're looking for. Once you understand that framework and think about your own rules, just swipe your way through Tinder to happiness. You'll find the right person. <laughs> But in addition to these rules we've got about um, that we have for ourselves, and you have to recognize, of course, everyone else has their stack of rules that they've layered up on top of themselves. When you're actually in a friendship or other relationship with people, you build relationships. That's where you build the contracts that lawyers build. So to take an example from my life, my wife, Jessica, uh, does, she views doing dishes as a chore. I view doing dishes as a privilege. To me, it's like my meditative moment. And by the way, if you want to talk on the sort of a legal analysis of how you should load the dishwasher, I got that ready. Um, but I, I love it. I love do it. So we set up a contract in our relationship. I do the dishes. Everybody wins. But it doesn't just have to be on that kind of procedural thing, like how you squeeze the toothpaste, all those kind of dumb things. Also on more profound things, things that are more important to a relationship. Things like monogamy, or faith and morality, or questions like, are we going to have kids? How many kids are we going to have? Um, all those kinds of things are additional contracts that you make in a relationship. Now, so that's guiding through rules. Now we're seeing layering on rules. What about this third one of changing jurisdictions? I remember 20 years ago, sitting uh, on a rooftop with some friends of mine in college, high on life and marijuana. <laughs> and thinking to myself, with the relationship I was in at the time, thinking to myself, you know, I'm not following the rules here. 
We've got some fundamental rules and understanding in this relationship, and I'm in what lawyers would call breach of contract. I was in material breach of contract. So what should I do here? The answer is pretty clear. Change jurisdictions. Change jurisdictions. We broke up. And a couple of years later, I met this wonderful woman, Jessica, who became my wife, mother of my two children. Worked out. Now I have no trouble following the contract. We got it worked out. And uh, you just, it, it, it sounds maybe overly analytical. It's that easy. If the contract isn't working, you find yourself breaching the contract, get out, find yourself a new jurisdiction. <laughs> so that's about it. Um, <laughs> I do want to say that like any analytical approach, um, legal thinking has its limits. You have to use it judiciously. It's, it's, I guess it's not good, but that's a legal pun. You got to use it judiciously. Um, so uh, you, know, you can come off as cold and analytical every time Jess says to me, don't lawyer me on this, then I know I've gone too far. Um, also, there's this risk of like when I was in law school and a couple years afterwards, I totally lost my sense of humor. So I understood the rule that there are jokes in the world. I understood you should laugh at them. And I even could recognize when they were being told, but in my mind, like if you think about why did the chicken cross the road, that joke, in my mind, I'd be like, chickens live in pens <laughs> or hen houses, and they are terrified birds. They are not going near a car. <laughs> right? But you know, you, know how, you learn how to laugh along. Um, but uh, in any event, you can't take legal thinking too far. But if you just remember these things, guide yourself through the rules, notice how we layer on the rules and build contracts, change jurisdictions when necessary, legal thinking can help improve your life. Thanks.